I came to Gandhi as channeled by Eric Erickson, and it is mostly Erickson's psychobiography of Gandhi that I want to discuss this evening, though I will add my own reflections. Uh, I run a monthly seminar in New York on violence and peacemaking with some distinguished psychoanalysts and other intellectuals that is into its third year. One of our concerns has been how nonviolence can work and what is the psychology of peacemaking. If that is my contemporary experience, my personal journey with Gandhi and Erickson has been long in the making. My first job as an academic 100 years ago came because a student had read the newly published Gandhi's Truth in the late 1960s and miraculously convinced the history department at what became my college that no department of history could claim to be self-respecting without someone versed in history and psychoanalysis. I may have killed the goose that laid the golden egg because that was the first and last time that such a position existed at an American university. But Erickson was already long my hero before that. As a senior at Harvard in 1965, I took his course on the human life cycle. On the recommended reading list was his 1958 book, Young Man Luther. I read it, was transfixed, and said to myself, that is what I want to do with my life, and I have. Erickson's Gandhi also transformed me personally. I was a 60s radical and felt passionately that the Vietnam War was a moral blot on America. I spent many weekends in graduate school at the University of Chicago at one demonstration or another, was one of the student leaders when we took over the administration building to the chagrin of my mother, who was a dean in the School of Social Work, uh, was tear gassed in Grant Park more than once, and placed flowers in the rifles of the National Guard in front of the Hilton Hotel during the raucous Democratic Convention of 1968. But until I read Erickson's Gandhi, I didn't understand the importance of self-purification in a campaign of nonviolence. Gandhi persuaded me to stop eating meat. Uh, I should say that, if, having read Gandhi, I, uh, uh, having read Erickson, I then read Gandhi. Gandhi persuaded me to stop eating meat, which I followed for some 30 years until I fell off the wagon a couple of decades ago. Um, <clears throat> Gandhi insisted, by the way, that those in his ashram uh, not eat meat uh, later on. Uh, I discovered in the, in the process of my vegetarian project, my failed vegetarian project, However, as he did, that defining vegetarian is not straightforward. What is meat? Is it only beef? Does it include fish? Do you not eat animal products like milk? And most of all, what's the point of the project? For Gandhi, vegetarianism was tied to his religion, and especially his vow to his mother, Kasturba, not to eat meat. On that, she was at. I don't share Gandhi's particular religious concerns, which made explaining to myself what I was doing especially complicated. Eventually, I came to agree with the philosopher Peter Singer that the point is not to kill in order to eat, which for many, especially younger people, has an added significance in an age of the twin apocalyptic dangers of nuclear destruction and global warming which hang over us. In my more recent reflections at my failed experiment with vegetarianism, I have returned to Gandhi's implicit idea of self-purification as a part of a nonviolent struggle. What that means in practice will vary according to personal taste, cultural and political norms, and one's spiritual inclinations. <clears throat> For make no mistake about it, Satyagraha, as my friend James W. Jones, a religion scholar, has pointed out recently, is a spiritual practice. Satyagraha is a spiritual practice. Gandhi, of course, also felt deeply that sexual abstinence was his required path to effective moral and political leadership. Sex for him was tainted. It was not unusual in his culture at the time. His father arranged Mohan's marriage to Kutali Ba when he was 13. 
There were ominous signs from the outset. The father rushed a trip to make the elaborate wedding ceremony, <clears throat> and his coach overturned on a jagged road, seriously wounding him. He managed to hide how badly he was hurt during the ceremony, but in fact his wounds worsened in time, and he would die from complications related to them three years later. The young Gandhi paid scant attention to his father at the wedding ceremony, and soon threw himself enthusiastically into sex with his young wife. He thought of her all the time and seemed to have sex with her on a daily basis, though it's worth noting there were extended periods of separation. He became furiously jealous and would not let her go anywhere without his permission. Later he recognized how constrained her life, how, how he had constrained her life, and how in the process of satisfying his passions, he neglected his goal of teaching her to read, which left him feeling guilty for the rest of his life. But more importantly, Gandhi's carnal lust, as he called it, for his wife distracted him from caring adequately for his dying and ambivalently loved father. He was 16. In one room, he regularly nursed his father, changed the dressings, and did all he could to relieve his suffering from the infected leg. But even as he nursed his father, Gandhi thought of sex. On the evening his father died, Gandhi had left him to go wake up in Talibah and have sex with her. She was pregnant at the time and later miscarried. Sex and death became inextricably intertwined in Gandhi's mind. If he had been there with his father, Kaba Gandhi might have survived. Instead, Mohan was lost in the enjoyment of sex with his wife at the actual moment of his father's death. At some level, it seems, Gandhi felt his lust had killed his father, and it is worth noting his unborn child. In the often contradictory way that these things work, however, Gandhi came in time to blame his father for the trauma he suffered. The father should never have married him off at 13. Child marriage was a, quote, cruel custom in India, this is quote, uh, but still something his father should have had the sense not to inflict on him. The father, furthermore, had his own issues with sex, as he was, quote, given to carnal pleasure, Gandhi says on the very first page of his autobiography. Kaba Gandhi's first two wives had died, but his third wife was still alive, just put away as a hopeless invalid before he married Gandhi's mother, his fourth wife. The oversexed father, in other words, as Gandhi imagined him in his unconscious, cast an intergenerational curse on him. Erickson concludes more generally that a man, and he means a men, he doesn't mean all people, a man uh, uh, must, quote, give an account of his conflicts with his father in order to, quote, make sexuality amenable to mastery. Gandhi found it extremely difficult to achieve that mastery. He found sticking to the vow of Brahmacharya a nearly impossible task. It was only after he had four children and was 37 years of age that he was able to commit himself successfully to abstinence and feel clean enough spiritually to carry out his political campaign. We are the beneficiaries of his remarkable journey and his particular path of self-purification that led in time to a fully developed theory of Satyagraha. The tainted issues of his desire, however, suffer. That brings us to the story of Meta, Gandhi's Muslim adolescent friend who sorely tested his vows of vegetarianism and fidelity. Gandhi honors the story of Metab in two chapters of his autobiography, one entitled A Tragedy, and the second, A Tragedy, in parentheses, continued, close parentheses. Metab repeatedly urged Gandhi to eat meat. It was the only way to be strong, he said, like the English. After being badgered, Gandhi finally agreed to try some goat meat. He hated it, and that night had a horrible nightmare that a live goat 
was bleeding inside it. Maytab gave up on that project, but soon turned to what he considered Gandhi's weakness for his faithfulness to his wife. He insisted they visit prostitutes. Gandhi again protested, but eventually gave in. He was a coward, he said. He was saved only by his inability to get an erection in what he called this, quote, den of vice. The woman lost her patience at his impotence and threw him out of the brothel, shouting, quote, abuses and insults. What is not entirely clear from Gandhi's account, however, is whether subsequent visits were more successful. He says there were, quote, four more similar incidents, though in most quote, of them, he was, quote, saved by good fortune. So what happened when fortune failed to intervene? Gandhi's wife, mother, and larger family all hated Meta. Yet Gandhi resolutely stuck by what Erickson calls this embodiment of his negative identity. Quote, by choosing Maytab as a friend, he unconsciously tested himself in order to prove to himself that he could sin and test the limits of that experience too. Unquote. Erickson even wonders if we shouldn't erect a statue somewhere to Maytab. For a great man must first engage even embrace his negative identity before he can find it in himself to discard it. That process, however, can pose great challenges for those intimately caught up in the negativity. Consider Arilla, Gandhi's oldest son, who grew up with Maytab on the margins of the family as his father became a charismatic icon and an impossibly virtuous man. How does a son find anything to correct or complete in a father of such unrelenting goodness and often self-righteous moralizing? There was nothing for Harilal to live out in Gandhi's life, Erickson says, that remained recognizably unlived as a mourned and abandoned potential, except the old man's negative identity, his murdered self." Unquote. Harillo was only able to find a usable identity in Maytag, and only in Maytag. It was a sad choice, however, for Harillo, Harillo became a Muslim, like Maytag, but also a derelict, and a year after Gandhi's death was found in a coma in an unknown locality, which of course meant an improper burial. Erickson divides his book into two parts, the past and the event. The first part describes young Gandhi, his childhood, his experiences in England studying law, and his formative years in South Africa. The second half of the book, the event, then describes Gandhi's campaign of Satyagraha in Ahmedabad that involved the first time his use of a fast as part of a political campaign. Erickson argues that the Ahmedabad strike defined the new directions of his ideas about the politics of nonviolence and established his identity as the leader of a national movement of revitalization that aimed to break the bondage with Great Britain. But halfway through his book, Erickson stops his own narrative and writes the Mahatma a 25-page letter. The letter is a pained but exquisitely powerful cry of despair over what he argues is a form of violence embedded in Gandhi's developing sense of Satyagraha. <clears throat> the letter itself has a context, as he read it in draft form in the living room of Robert J. Lifton's Wellfleet home in Cape Cod in August of 1967. Lifton had recently begun his annual psychohistory meetings that were to last then for 50 years. I attended 40 years of the meetings, but unfortunately, was not yet in Lifton's orbit. He's my mentor, somewhere between my mentor and my guru. Uh, <clears throat> and I wasn't in his orbit in 1967, though it was uh, an honor to get to know Erickson later. It is a scene worth pondering. Erickson is in front of the fireplace, sitting on the couch, facing the ocean in Lifton's living room, as he read his letter to Gandhi to a small group of leading psychologically and politically committed intellectuals 
that included Daniel Ellsberg, Norman Birnbaum, Kenneth Keniston, and others, at a moment of intense ferment over the war in Vietnam. The peace movement then risked veering off into violence. Erickson wanted to reassert the significance of Satyagraha for Americans, but he felt deeply troubled by a psychological violence that lay at the heart of Gandhi's truth. At one point well into his autobiography, Gandhi, always given to critical self-assessment, muses about the historical veracity of his story. Has he omitted important parts of the narrative? Would his account stand up in a court of law? Surely, he argues, some busybody could flatter himself by showing up the hollowness of many of my pretensions. Erickson embraces that role of the busybody because he says, quote, I seem to sense the presence of a kind of untruth in the very protestation of truth, of something unclean when all the words spelled out in unreal purity, and above all, of displaced violence where nonviolence was the professed issue. Gandhi tells the story of family life in Durban, South Africa, <clears throat> at a time he was beginning to assembly a motley bunch of stray individuals whom he would soon forge into followers able to lead the coming nonviolent campaigns for social and political justice. It seems it never occurred to Gandhi to ask his wife what she felt about turning their house into a political commune. He insisted she accept the changed circumstances of their lives and most of all to take it on cheerfully. For the most part, she accepted things without question and with a genuine sense of joy. But Gandhi also insisted that he and she cheerfully empty the chamber pots, as there was no inside plumbing in their house at the time. When one such pot contained the waste of a man who was a Christian by religion and an untouchable by caste, she grimaced. He became furious, and she exclaimed, quote, keep your house to yourself and let me go. At that outburst, he showed her to the gate, at which point she broke down in despair and righteous anger. They made up, as they always did after these fights, and Gandhi acknowledges her, quote, matchless powers of endurance, though he stopped short of fully owning the difficulty for Kasturba of obeying his authoritarian demands to break radically with custom and, most of all, to do it with a smile on your face. It was the same with his early attempts to educate her. He was, as he describes himself, a, quote, truly kind husband, unquote, who, quote, harassed her out of my blind love for her. Now, there's something missing in this notion of cruel kindness and blind love that involves harassment. Psychologically, Gandhi seems unable to grant that ambivalence lurks in our hearts, even and maybe most especially in those of us who work for peace. The future of Satyagraha is at stake, Erickson argues. A demanding moralism won't work. Here Erickson calls forth the wisdom of Freud and psychoanalysis. We cannot pretend to deny, quote, our inner ambiguities, ambivalences, and instinctual conflicts, and only an additional leverage of truth based on self-knowledge promises to give us freedom in the full light of conscious day, unquote. The alternative is a kind of, quote, moralistic terrorism that drives our worst inclinations and feelings underground quote, to remain there until riotous conditions of uncertainty or chaos, chaos, unquote, encourage their emergence with redoubled and often deadly energy. Quote, excess and riot follow repression and suppression. Erickson says at another point, precisely because of the autocratic and blind nature of moralistic restraint. Ethics must replace moralism an ethics that is marked by an insightful assent to human values, whereas moralism is blind obedience. Ethics is transmuted, transmitted with, quote, informed persuasion rather than absolute interdicts. Erickson is particularly troubled by Gandhi's failure ever to recognize that a sexual relationship can be characterized by mutuality. 
This, this by no means, this is by no means a capacity easy, easily developed or sustained without self-control and sacrifice, Erickson says, but as an approximation and a goal, it describes the only kind of sexual relationship in which the other person does not become a mere object either of sexual or aggressive desire, unquote. That's perfectly reasonable, it seems to me, given Gandhi's particular experiences and sexual traumas, as well as his religious background, that he would find in Brahmacharya a resolution of his inner conflicts. Out of that new self, sealed with a vow, he found the strength to forge a new politics of nonviolence that may represent our only hope of survival. In another place, Erickson says, patients, great or small, are increasingly debilitated by their inner conflicts. But in historical actuality, inner conflict only adds an indispensable momentum to all superhuman effort. But along the way, Gandhi had to weaponize phallic, phallic desire. Kasturba managed to resist him where she felt she needed to defend the ground of her being. That has led some intellectuals who like to malign Satyagraha to claim her as the real saint. Though Erickson sniffs with disdain, what do intellectuals know about sainthood? For most of us struggling to find a usable form of nonviolent peacemaking, the point is a tyrannical opposition to desire and ambivalence will restrict the usefulness of Satyagraha. Gandhi liked to tell the story of Prahlad, the boy prince who would not accept the claim of his father, the demon king, to have powers greater than God. The boy is tortured terribly for not acknowledging his father's claims. The father's final challenge to the boy is to embrace a red-hot metal pillar. But as Prahlad embraces this suggestive phallic object, out steps God, half, <clears throat> half lion and half man, who tears the king to pieces. Gandhi called the boy the first Satyagrahi, perhaps. But what is the message to his own sons, whom he repeatedly threatened to disown and disavow when their truth meant rebellion against him? Who is the demon, demon king? Now, I would not want to conclude by giving the impression that Erickson or I busybodies that we are, question the significance of Satyagraha because its founder was flawed, aren't we all? That is not the question. Satyagraha, as I mentioned, is a spiritual practice. We take on its challenge, challenges as Jesus did going into the desert or facing his death with a reluctant calm. Participation in a nonviolent campaign requires self-purification and a willingness to accept unflinchingly the violence of those whose evil practices you're trying to change. Now on this question of, just on a side note, this question of self-purification, I, I happened to share my talk with my mentor, Robert J. Lifton, and <clears throat> who's written a lot about um, uh, uh, Chinese thought reform and Om Shinrikyo, the Japanese cult, and uh, of course the Nazis, his Nazi doctor book. Um, and he raised the question, where, what are the limits of self-purification? And I think it's something we can, we can talk about. Um, because with the um, <clears throat> with Chinese thought reform, of course, as we were talking earlier today, Chinese thought reform uh, uh, pushed self-purification to its, its dangerous and absurd limits, um, as did the uh, Om Shinrikyo. Uh, and of course, the most extreme historical example would be the uh, the biological purification of the uh, Nazi doctors. I still think the essence, that, that given that, that, that uh, Satyagraha is a spiritual practice, I think the, uh, it involves a form of self-purification. But it can be a risky business, this nonviolence. The two most important Satyagrahis in the 20th century, Gandhi and Martin Luther King, were assassinated. Nonviolence is also probably not an, a, a politics that is appropriate to all contexts of intractable conflict, such as the Nazis or the Soviets under the brutal and paranoid leadership of Stalin. But what I feel is the single most important feature of Gandhi's truth 
Something not really emphasized by Erickson is that a nonviolent struggle seeks to eliminate a demonstrable evil, assault tax for a country surrounded by ocean, or forcing blacks to sit in the back of the bus, <clears throat> but in the process to make your opponent a better person ethically. The best context for such a satyagra struggle, I think, are when basically good people get caught up in carrying out evil for all kinds of historical reasons. The British in India and whites in the Old South were like that. They were good people with a bad theory. I know the South best as I am from Georgia and my family goes back there over two centuries, even including running large slave plantation near Atlanta in the first half of the 19th century. I was in high school in the South in the 1950s. The barriers that divided black and white were visible, strong, terrifyingly harsh, and brutally humiliating to blacks. Some 70 years later, and after the Civil Rights Movement, <clears throat> it is amazing how readily the races mix in the South now. Politics in a place like Georgia have been transformed, education improved, and so on. One of my sons married a African-American woman, and my grandchildren, who are now young teens, have been visiting me in, where I go in August in North Florida, near Georgia, <clears throat> uh, for the last decade. Um, and they have never, in the entire, over a decade, they have never faced any kind of discrimination. In an earlier generation, I could never have taken them to dinner with me. They would have had to wait in the car if I went shopping. I could never have stayed in the same motel during my vacation. If we rode a bus, I would have had to be in the front and they in the back, and on and on and on. Of course, there's a long way to go. But the civil rights movement, which remained remarkably nonviolent, eliminated de jure injustices and changed the most offensive de facto insults of segregation but it also made whites in the South better human beings. Satyagraha probably won't work where you have bad people with a bad theory, but hopeless optimist that I am, I would tend to see Nazi Germany or the Soviet Union in the 1930s as historical exceptions rather than the rule. Gandhi's remarkable legacy is a new theory of politics for a world caught up with a rising tide of global authoritarianism, and most of all, the ultimate threats to existence we face with nuclear weapons and now with global warming. It is true, as the poet Theodor Rothke says, that in a dark time the eye begins to see, but we also need a theory of nonviolence to guide us as we struggle with peacemaking in situations of seemingly intractable conflict. Gandhi's own human failings identify the specific areas that allow us to reconsider his theories to build a nonviolent practice that is relevant for our own flawed selves. Thank you. justifying evil uh, reached uh, uh, new levels of, 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 of narrative power for people. So that the book that um, uh, Scott mentions is unfortunately a very readable novel, The Turner Diaries. Um, and uh, Timothy McVeigh slept with it under his, under his pillow. Um, and it sells in gun shows um, and is really the Bible of the right wing in America. So unlike Mein Kampf, people really read the, the Turner Diaries. Um, but I think the larger question you're asking is sort of why, why do we have a, a Nazi Germany rise in the 1930s and, 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 and Soviet uh, uh, use? I think it has to do with the chaos, the, the specific historical, uh, particularly with Germany, uh, the same thing with, with Russia, the sort of dislocations caused by World War I, uh, the grand humiliation, the sense of dislocation. Um, and, and, and then you have a kind of, a, you have a society and a politics organized around violence where it's embraced and believed
And, and, and I think in, in those situations, it's hard to imagine somebody, and, and you know, Gandhi did not believe this, but, but I, I think it's hard to imagine somebody of his persuasion, or our persuasion, standing up in a nonviolent way, you'd be killed right away. So um, uh, certainly the, 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 the larger question of sort of why we have that kind of evil emerging, uh, which as I said, I think is the exception, not the rule. I, I, maybe I'm excessively hopeful, uh, but I do believe it's 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 the uh, uh, exception rather than the, rather than the rule. Um, but we do need, we we need to identify. We need to recognize that those situations arise, and we need to identify where, in most situations, where a, a campaign of nonviolence will be so much more effective and so much more lasting um, and consequential as the civil rights movement in the South, which seemed to go on forever, seemed to not do anything. And as I said, 70 years later, whites in the South are better people. <laughs> and that's, that's always the, uh, you know, that's always going to be the goal. That one of the things that's so characteristic of, of, the, of the, the theory of nonviolence that Gandhi articulated that then King implemented, and of course King wrote his PhD on, on, uh, on Gandhi, so it, it, it really was uh, 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 implementing Gandhi's idea in, in the Old South in the 19, from 1955 till about 1965. Um, but one of, the, one of the ideas, yes, that you, you, you seek out people to bring, to, to, to enhance the better angels of their nature, uh, as Lincoln put it, but in a, in a, in the campaign itself is not global and against everything. The campaign is very focused so that you take, you take something which is the most demonstrable evil and then you mobilize your entire forces against it and with, a, with people willing and this is what makes it a spiritual practice, willing to die in order to right that particular wrong, so that the wrong needs to be visible, palpable, and something that everybody in, in the society, that in the culture, historical moment, knows at some level is wrong. That's why it's so important that it's the sort of good people with a bad theory, where, where it's going to work best. Um, so you take the salt tax. And you focus every, it's not as though the salt tax was the only evil in colonial Britain. I mean, in India, it was, of course, it was manifest. You could have listed hundreds, scores of, of evils, of, of injustices that pervaded the British rule in India, right? He chose the salt tax because it was totally absurd and offensive and part of the life of every single Indian that they had to pay a tax on something that all you had to do was walk to the beach and dip up a little water and make your own salt, right? It's the same thing that Martin Luther King chose in beginning the uh, civil rights struggle in the South and chose Rosa Parks, who was deliberately planted, it was all planned, uh, for her in 1955 in Montgomery, Alabama to walk to the front of the bus. Now, that campaign, that action, which then is the beginning of the civil rights movement in the, in the Old South, happened to be, was, was staged, but it also was because there was a, at that point a liberal uh, Supreme Court and had just passed the Brown versus Board of Education over overturning de facto seg segregation in the South, <clears throat> 1954. So that, you, but anybody witnessing, anybody witnessing, knowing, reading about, seeing on television, Rosa Parks walked to the front of the bus at some level. Anyone who is even remotely a decent human being knows that it's absurd for her to sit in a hot Montgomery summer day in the back of the bus. And so it, it focuses on the demonstrable evil in order to build the campaign more generally against desegregation, against sitting at, 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 at the de facto segregation, we couldn't sit at uh, lunch counters, against the jury at, uh, education, which kept a, a, a segregation which kept blacks out, out of the educational system, and on and on and on. Those topple down the line. Those topple once the campaign is really in motion and uh, culminating to the major, you know, the major legislation. Well, Supreme Court decision is 1954. The major legislation is not till the mid 60s. So you had 10 years 
of the Civil Rights Campaign, which began in this sort of seemingly relatively insignificant way, but is deliberately chosen because it is so obviously wrong. And people, it's wrong, and people can see it's wrong, and, and even though it might take them a couple of decades to admit that it's wrong, when it's changed, they are better for sitting next to blacks when they take the bus to work in 1972. Yeah. China is terrifying in its um, imposition of, uh, its cruel imposition uh, of authoritarian rule. Hong Kong with its different tradition, Western tradition, they haven't been, you know, they haven't been uh, a part of China for that long. They're increasingly getting absorbed uh, by China. And it, it represents a, a very effective cry of the oppressor. Now, you know, there are some nonviolent elements. They, they, they do exist on, on the edge. Um, but the core of the protest is nonviolent. Now, what China, how long China will allow it to continue is an open question. Um, but the, the, the core of the campaign is, is bringing the world into a greater awareness of the, it seems to me, of the kind of oppressive political rule that China has increasingly demanded of its 1.4 billion people and is not allowing in uh, Hong Kong. So that the largely young people are, you know, which began over, I mean, demonstrations began over a relatively trivial uh, law that uh, Lam was trying to uh, uh, institute, which would allow extradition to China. Um, and then that became the whole basis for the campaign. You've got to not implement the law, in fact, you've got to abolish the law, and then there were other demands, and you need to basically ensure our uh, independence. You, you know, it could end badly. It could end badly, but it's a very moving uh, cry, uh, nonviolent, mostly nonviolent cry, um, for uh, continued autonomy, relative autonomy, from the um, uh, really oppressive rule of, uh, of China. And I think that, you know, social media, television, newspapers, international, global communication world has made, I think it's, it's, in, it's raised the level of awareness of the world of sort of what they're up against um, and, and the demands themselves and the fact that people are willing week after week, month after month, they keep demonstrating. They don't give up. Obviously, they feel with great passion the need to resist the juggernaut of the, uh, of the Chinese. One word about, the, I mentioned at the beginning that I'm working on, on the peace process in Northern Ireland, which Greg knows a lot about. One of the things that they were very, there, George Mitchell and John Alderdice and everyone who was leading the, the uh, peace process, particularly after 1994, um, and all through the, the Good Friday negotiations from 1996, 1996 to 98, um, the violence continued. The violence continued by dissident groups, both loyalist and, uh, and, and, and in the uh, Republican. The goal was to continue the negotiations and the move nonviolently toward creating a new peace process that could resolve this, these awful decades of violence. In, in, in this small area. Um, and as long as the violence was with dissidents, <coughs> this process has got its own complicated narrative and that's you know, endlessly interesting, but the process was one where you, you stayed committed to your ideals because you could believe in your ideals, you knew they were right, and they dominated most people who were, who were entering into the political process. Um, always threatened by the violence that's occurring by the dissidents on the fringes. And that's exactly what's happening in, in Hong Kong, seems to me, it's exactly. Now, we don't know where it's gonna end up. Um, and, you know, in Hong Kong, a small territory up against, up against China, it could be very scary. I mean, one man could change his mind and we could have another Tiananmen Square and it'd all be over. Today, unfortunately, was the first death in Hong Kong. Yes, sir.
For Gandhi, his path to truth involved certain definite decisions, involved abstinence because of the sexual traumas that he encountered, and it involved vegetarianism because of his culture and also because of a specific vow to his mother. I think as, I, as Erickson details with great sensitivity, he was, he was flawed in the imposition and a kind of a moralistic terrorism, as Erickson calls it, in imposing that will on others, insisting that everybody, all of his followers, be vegetarian, of followers that uh, uh, certainly didn't insist that everybody be sexually abstinent, but he certainly wanted it that way. And, 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 and then, you know, as Erickson describes with great sensitivity, the difficulties that that presented for his four sons, who were the issues of, that, of his own sin. That's Gandhi's struggle. Out of his struggle, he created a theory that worked for him. He was while he was a charismatic leader, he was able to mobilize a, a movement of national revitalization in India and, and create a lot, of, a lot of good along the way. I would say, personally, that we need to draw back and rethink the model. Not to say, that not to emphasize that he was flawed, which he was, we're all flawed, but how can we, how can we translate say, the issues of purification. How can we translate that into terms that have meanings for us in specific situations? In the Old South, led by black preachers, it meant singing and singing and praying and singing. It started in churches. It started in the Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta. That was the, the church of, of Martin Luther King's father, and that was the church of Martin Luther King, Jr. And they prayed, and they always, before a march, they would sing and they would pray. That was essential to the sort of their, their way of, of self-purification as they went out and Bull Connor released the, the dogs against them, and they knew they were going to be, get beaten up, and that's the whole point. That's another essential point of nonviolence, is to let yourself be hurt in order to, to uh, uh, enhance the struggle for nonviolence. About what? I'm sorry. Part of the way Gandhi proved his own abstinence was to have was to sleep with young yeah, yeah. women in his bed, and I'm not worried about him in that circumstance. I'm worried about them. Yeah, no, I, I, I personally, it's not. I would not think that that is something that would be a uh, a requirement for a nonviolent struggle working in other contexts. Right? So we have to find we have to find our own our own path, recognizing that. Gandhi's personal path is really not applicable for most of us in the world. That doesn't mean the satyagraha is not applicable. That, that's, that's my only point. The, uh, 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 I think the way to begin to conceptualize global warming is to recognize that it's a kind of a twin apocalyptic threat with nuclear threat. So that, you know, many people in the world imagine that nuclear threat was over in 1990 when we won the Cold War, right? It's actually more of a threat now. It's just that nobody thinks about it. And there's kind of a sequence, historical sequence from nuclear threat into global warming. We can learn much about protests against global warming from the anti-nuclear movement which occupied much of my life. Um, things like, in the 1980s, the Physicians Movement, PSR, the Physicians for Social Responsibility, actively campaigned against uh, uh, civil defense. Now, it's a little counterintuitive. Doctors campaigning against civil defense, which are trying to save lives in the case of it. Well, one of the things in New York was they, in the civil defense, um, brilliant bureaucrat dreamed it up. Um, they turned the subways into safe havens, right? So the doctors protested. They said, look, if a nuclear bomb hits New York and everyone runs into the subways, same thing in London, it's just a big coffin, right? So it, 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 it raised people, to, it, because it was so counterintuitive to have medical doctors opposing efforts by the government to presumably save lives.
So I think there's some lessons there with global warming. Now, it's different. It's a different issue. It's a slow burn to go with a, with a whimper rather than a bang. Um, as T.S. Eliot said, and, and, and it, it, unfortunately, the world seems to have not yet, the political leaders in the world seem to not yet have grappled with the, uh, the challenges. In fact, it's going in the wrong way. I mean, the worst leader in the world of the biggest economy is, is our own Donald Trump, who not only is ignoring climate change, he is a denier, which is extraordinary. Um, that said, I think nonviolent campaigns are ideally suited to climate change. And it is the issue that young people understand. They get it. You don't have to know the science that it's getting warming. You don't have to know that the Miami is going to wash away in a matter of years. You don't have to know the science to know that when a, when a, a, a chunk of ice in the Antarctic the size of Connecticut drops off, we'll have a 25-foot tsunami that's going to wipe out you know, every, all the cities from mostly wipe out from Boston to Miami and cause tens of thousands of deaths. Maybe the consciousness isn't raised yet, but once it is, it be, and partly because of the internet, the communication system can be so vast that it seems to me, and, pe and because people are so aware, they're so conscious of, of climate change. It, it, and we need to start thinking now, I think moral and political leaders need to start thinking now about how we can, in fact, organize a nonviolent campaign around climate change because it's going to come in big waves and it's going to come drip drip, but it's not going to go away. All we know for sure it's going to keep getting worse. We don't know exactly how and in what way it's going to keep getting worse. Um, but one of the course that Scott and I taught for many years, <clears throat> well, um, there was a famous um, article about lead leaderless resistance, uh, taking advantage of the internet for leaderless resistance. Now this is right wing. <laughs> white violence in America, it was sort of neo-fascist stuff. In a way, the seems to me, and we see with Hong Kong, the, the, the means of communication, which are now so universal, are in fact the, 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 the basis for organizing what could really be a true global, a true global uh, campaign of nonviolence non uh, against global change. You know what we lack? We lack a moral leader right now. And that's why there's a little, I, I feel it, and I would suspect you would too, there's a little bit of a disarray. We don't have a Gandhi of, of, of climate change. We don't have a Martin Luther King. Uh, uh, I think they'll come. I, I think they will, they will come and adapt the message in a way that, that is, is one that recognizes equality and justice and, and, and between peoples and, 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 and there can be uh, uh, maybe a forging of a movement that could really begin to reverse some of the, the apocalyptic threats. They really are, they're apocalyptic threats of climate change.